fortunately, we have vaccines that work. Uh, and I wanted to describe a little bit about how vaccines uh, work in general and how these vaccines work, because that is our path forward. And that's how we get back to a normal life. So these are the different ways that vaccines uh, can be developed, the, the major buckets uh, by, by which we have been able to, to develop vaccines uh, in the future uh, and, uh, and in the past. So in the past, if you look, say, at polio vaccine or at most of the vaccines that we have had uh, over the course of our lifetime, we have either taken an inactivated virus or have taken a live attenuated or a live weakened virus, manufactured that, and then injected that into people to elicit an immune response and protect them from a disease. Um, what we've seen developed uh, over the course uh, of the COVID pandemic is multiple other approaches to try to more quickly develop a vaccine and be able to mass produce a vaccine so that we could interrupt this pand pandemic considerably quickly, uh, considerably more quickly. Um, so these are the two types of vaccines that we have seen come into production across the US. So an RNA vaccine was developed by Pfizer and by Moderna. A viral vector vaccine was uh, developed by Johnson & Johnson. The vast majority of the US population has received the mRNA vaccine. Uh, this is a complicated diagram that shows how that vaccine works. What you see at the top is a yellow circle, um, which, which is a lipid nanoparticle. So think of it like a soap bubble uh, containing a small amount of genetic material, which is messenger RNA. That is what is injected into your deltoid muscle. It then enters cells. That red squiggly line there is that messenger RNA or genetic material. What your body does with that is it takes that, that small amount of viral genetic material and then produces viral proteins, uh, the spike protein, which is the signature protein on this virus, um, which your body needs to recognize in order for immunity uh, to be produced. It takes that spike protein, that goes through your cell, and you then generate immune cells and antibodies which can react to that spike protein should you encounter the real COVID vaccine or COVID virus in the future. What we saw in trials is that nearly a hunt that this virus, this vaccine was nearly a hundred percent effective in the prevention of death or hospitalization from COVID-19. It was 90 to 95 percent protective against developing any symptomatic infection with COVID-19. And it's been shown subsequently to greatly decrease your risk of infecting other people um, if you are to obtain the vaccine. These results are exactly what we hoped um, that we would get from this and was really fantastic news when we saw this hit the press and hit the medical literature in late November and early December. So the path to an mRNA vaccine is really interesting. I won't go into too many details because I know we're running short on time, but uh, mRNA was first discovered in the 1960s. We knew in the 1990s that this, uh, that this would be something that would be useful for therapeutics, but it took a couple of decades for, for some of these companies to take this uh, and, and figure out um, how to use this in a way that, um, that was effective in the body. Moderna, which is one of the companies that developed a vaccine, actually means modified RNA. It's a combination of those two words, and that is where they, they derive the name of their company. In 2018 is when we first saw lipid nanoparticles or these soap bubbles that house the vaccine or house the RNA um, that we're able to allow this vaccine to come to market. This is a timeline out of a medical journal that shows um, how long historically it has taken us to develop vaccines. And what you see on here is typically it's taken us three to eight years to figure out the science, 
two to 10 years to do the trials and then one or two years to get to get the vi vaccine approved through the regulatory process. The fact that this takes so long historically is one of the things that hit the press and one of the reasons that people were very skeptical of our vaccine enterprise and of the fact that we were able to figure out figure out how to make vaccines so quickly. The reason that we were able to do this so quickly is that is that modern medicine, modern equipment allows us to gene sequence very quickly. Scientists in China had actually released the gene sequence for SARS-CoV-2 um, before the disease even hit the United States. Part of the reason for this was we had done decades of work on a cousin virus, SARS-CoV-1, which caused the initial SARS outbreak in 2003. The knowledge from that allowed us to figure out this pathogen and get that genetic sequence put into the scientific literature very quickly. Uh, Moderna was actually able to take that sequence and develop a preliminary vaccine uh, over the course of only a few days. And they were able to do that fortuitously because they have developed this type of vaccine before trying to come up with vaccine for Zika virus and for influenza. So over the course of six months, we saw phase one trials um, occur from, from not only Moderna, but also Pfizer and other companies. And then in a three month time frame, we were able to take that data, do large scale phase three trials. And that was possible because so many people were getting COVID all at the same time. It made it very easy for the drug companies uh, and the universities to recruit patients or recruit people that were at risk for being exposed to, to the disease. That's unlike for Zika or some other rare diseases where you had to vaccinate millions of people to find people at risk. In this case, it was much easier to find people at risk of, of disease. So one of the things that gives me hope about this whole endeavor is this lipid nanoparticle technology and mRNA technology is really incredibly revolutionary. The fact that we were able to de develop an effective and safe vaccine in a very short time frame is something that gives me enormous hope for the future um, in that we will be able to do this again for new diseases and we will be able to do it quicker than we did even this time around, and we will be able to do it more safely with the experience that we've had this time around. Furthermore, uh, it is almost certain that this technology is going to lead to revolutionary therapies and cancer therapy in multiple other genetic conditions. The ability to do this and do it safely um, this has gotten us over the hump where, where incredibly important scientific research is going to come out of this work. So I wanted to show um, a, a graphic just to show how effective um, this vaccine is. So we talk about 95% effective at, at, at reducing cases. We, we talk about 100% effective at keeping people out of a hospital. Um, but this is the actual a graphic that came out of the medical journal for the initial Pfizer vaccine. And what the blue squares show is over time, after people were vaccinated, even getting their first dose, um, it shows people who were getting infected. Uh, so it shows of all the participants, what percent of those people were getting infections. In the red, what you see is of the people who got the vaccine, what percent of those were getting infections? And you see that even after a couple of weeks of the first dose, a pretty significant split between those people that got placebo or a saltwater injection or those people that got the real vaccine. So I think that this is very important uh, because it shows um, it shows how efficacious uh, in a graphic the vaccine really is in preventing disease. 
real world data has shown us the same thing. So uh, what you see in the graph at top is the percent of people from Israel, the United States and India uh, who have received vaccines. And what you see is Israel did an incredible job very early on at vaccinating their population. They were able to do this because they have a smaller contained country. They also have a huge pharmaceutical industry there uh, and they were able to quickly distribute and, and administer the vaccine to a large amount of their population. The US uh, has been catching up but was, was slower out of the start, but, but able to also vaccinate a significant portion of their population. India, a very large country, uh, many, many people below the poverty line, um, considerably, considerable more challenges in terms of, of getting the vaccine out to the population and distributing it. And what you see is the rate of change in death rates is that we've seen a huge spike week after week in India in terms of the number of people that are dying of COVID uh, over this same time frame, We've seen the US plateau and even come down uh, in multiple time frames, And we've seen Israel nearly, uh, nearly eradicate the disease uh, by vaccinating a large portion of their population. So the vaccine is effective and those, that's what those last couple graphs were meant to show. Uh, the other thing that, that's in the press, and for good reason, is what are the side effects of the vaccine? And for the mRNA vaccine, um, there is a, a problem with anaphylaxis, people uh, having a, a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine. This has been estimated to happen about two to five times for every million doses of vaccine administered. Um, I will say we have seen this in Sintera occur, um, but uh, we have also given out enormous uh, uh, numbers of vaccine to the populace. Um, for the mRNA vaccines, about 211 million doses uh, have been administered. Um, there have been about 3,400 people who have died in a short time frame after a dose. Um, when you look at that, at that rate, uh, of people passing away, it is not over what would be expected for a similar size group of people who had not been vaccinated. So the scientific community feels very strongly that this vaccination uh, is very safe uh, and that we uh, have, have done this very safely in our population. The adenoviral vector vaccine or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the US uh, it's also called the, Astra, the AstraZeneca vaccine is the European version of this. Um, there has been a rare blood clotting disorder, uh, which has been linked to that vaccine. That appears in about one per million doses. And it may uh, have an additive effect uh, if you're on oral contraceptive. So there are some warnings out uh, for particularly young women with that vaccine, uh, but it has now been reintroduced both in Europe and soon in the United States in terms of administering that vaccine again.